Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. We're supernatural church. Full of supernatural people. Amen. Which means we need a supernatural flow. Glory to God. Let's look together in the book of Acts chapter 4. What a privilege it is to be here with you today. I recognize that pastor, even though we've been doing some traveling through the week, he's been here on Sundays, but since I've been in Little Rock, it's been a long time since I've seen your smiling faces. It's so good to see each and every one of you here tonight. And I just bring great testimonies from Little Rock of all that God is doing. And I, I uh, have a young lady uh, in our church. Her name is Pam. And she had an accident five years ago that had caused an injury in her knee. And because of the way that she was trying to recover from it, she wore out her hip until her hip was bone upon bone. And she had prayer about two weeks ago. And I had already closed the service. The service was over. And she came up for prayer. And she said, I, I'm just, I am ready to receive my healing. I believe when you lay hands on me. And so we agreed and, and prayed the prayer of faith. And she took off walking around there, tears coming down her eyes. And she was lifting her legs. She said, I haven't been able to do this in five years. She got healed. She sent me a, a, a message later that week and she said, I've been shopping. I've been walking all through Walmart and the Whole Foods store. And she had been, and she got up this last Sunday and testified again about, the, and she was running around the pulpit. I'm, I'm teaching them how to run in Little Rock. And, and Pastor Paula, she took off running with me. I said, I brought a runner. And, and so... But praise God, the things that God is doing, it's a supernatural flow. And, and I shared with them Brother Steve Pitnick's testimony about his healing and his knees. And we're just rejoicing because this is not something for us to take lightly. Amen. When we have the supernatural power of God manifesting amongst us, we need to rejoice with those who do rejoice. We need to celebrate what God is doing amongst us. We need to recognize His hand is moving and honor Him and exalt Him in the midst of it. Amen? Acts chapter 4 verse 29 the disciples had been threatened not to preach anymore in the name of Jesus. They had been uh, um, given this charge, and instead of reacting in fear to what they were told, they went to the Lord, and they asked for something specific. In verse 29, it says, Now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching forth your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of your holy child Jesus and when they had prayed the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spoke the word of God with boldness hallelujah hallelujah their response to the threat, their response to the pressure of the situation was to go to God and ask God specifically. They specifically asked for the boldness to speak the word and they specifically asked for God to respond with a supernatural flow, to respond with stretching forth his hand to heal for signs, and for wonders to be done in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. When we look and we think about healing, and we think about signs and wonders being done, we recognize that we are talking about the manifestation of the power gifts. Amen. So their specific prayer was, God, we want to see your power gifts manifested. We want to see the gifts of healing manifested amongst us. We want to see signs and wonders, the, 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 um, the working of miracles, the gift of faith. Hallelujah. If you, if you are wondering where I'm, I'm 
quoting these power gifts from, we find them listed over in 1 Corinthians. Let's go and look for just a moment at 1 Corinthians. And I want to look specifically at chapter 12. Verse 7 says, The manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. The manifestation of the Spirit is given... When this says to every man, recognize that verse 1 of this chapter, we're talking about the brethren. So the manifestation of the gifts is given amongst the brethren, people who already have Jesus as their Lord. These manifestation of spiritual gifts are not available for people outside of Christ. The only requirement to receive the power of God flowing through this baptism in the Holy Spirit is that we be born again. When, the, uh, when Peter got up and, and uh, preached in Acts chapter uh, 2 and Acts chapter 3, after that the Holy Ghost had been poured out on the day of Pentecost, he gets up and he begins to preach and he says, what you're seeing and what you're hearing is the promise of the Father and the promise of the Father is available to you and all you need to do is repent and be baptized and receive the promise of the Father. So being born again is the only requirement or the only, the only necessity in order to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And in order for us to have the power flow of the power gifts operating, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the receiving of these empowerments. What we're seeing here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is an explanation of these power gifts. Verse 8, and the other gifts of the Spirit. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these work that one and the self same Spirit dividing to every man's severally as he wills. Now recognize when Jesus was speaking in John chapter 4, he said to the woman at the well, he said, he that believes on me out of his belly, he's going to have a, 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 a well of living water springing up. But when he speaks to the woman in John chapter 7, when he speaks to the people who are all gathered together at the great feast and they're having the ceremony of the pouring out of the waters in recognition of how David had poured the waters out that were taken from the well at Bethlehem and they're having this feast and Jesus stands up and interrupts the whole service and he says, I am the drink offering. I am the living water. And he that believes on me out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. So we see him explaining there's a well of water in John chapter 4, but we see he explains that there is a there are rivers multiplied, rivers of living water explained in John chapter 7. Well, the well of water, water is the indwelling of the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God lives inside every believer. If you have received Jesus as the Lord and the Savior of your life, you are are indwelt by His Spirit. The Bible says, Know ye not that you are the temple of the Most High God and that God dwells within you? Romans chapter 8 talks about if the same one who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. Hallelujah. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit belongs to every believer. You are already indwelt. You are the temple. Then the Greek, that word temple is the Greek word naos, N-A-O-S. And it is the same word used to describe the holy of holies. In other words, you aren't the outer court. You aren't the place where the, the brazen altar is. You are not the place where the labor is. You are not even in the place. You are not even the holy place on the outside where certain people, but you are. Your heart is the holy of holies where God himself comes down and dwells because you are the place where the blood has been poured out. You are the place where the mercy seat of God on your heart. Hallelujah. You are the holy of holies. 
Hallelujah. You are the indwelling temple of the Holy Spirit. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. The greater one dwells in you. The spirit of God. The comforter. The intercessor. The mediator. The standby. Hallelujah. The helper. The comforter. He dwells in you. Glory to God. So the John chapter 4 experience is speaking of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And there's a result of John chapter 4. Galatians chapter 5 tells us what is produced in the life of a believer by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Galatians chapter 5 is where we find the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, meekness, temperance, faith. The fruit of the Spirit is the result of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Because He lives in me, because His Spirit dwells within me. I have the fruit of the Spirit, or you could say the characteristics of God. God is love. God is love. That is the first characteristic of the fruit or that which is produced in you by the indwelling of His Spirit. The love of God is shed abroad in your heart, constantly being poured out in your heart by the Holy Ghost who lives in you, we could add. Amen? So Galatians chapter 5 is connected to John 4, if you will. John chapter 4, the well of water, is connected to the fruit of the Spirit that is produced in the life of a believer by your salvation experience. But John 7 has a result as well. John 7, we find the results of it here in 1 Corinthians 12. John 7, he said... He that believes in me out of his belly, and that word belly does not mean your stomach or your intestines or your your organs of digestion. That word belly means your innermost being, out of your innermost being, out of your spirit, out of your inner man, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. And then the the Bible says, This spake he of the Holy Ghost who had not yet been poured out or had not yet been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Jesus was not yet glorified. So that's indicating that the, what he is speaking of in John chapter 7 could not be given, could not be released until Jesus was glorified. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So when we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and we see what these rivers produce in the life of the believer, we recognize that these are supernatural operations. These are the gifts of the Spirit. These are not your gifts. These are His gifts that He lets us operate. These gifts are not given because you say, "Mm, I like that one. Give me that one, Lord. I don't want that discerning of spirits thing. I could do without that. Let's just choose. No, no, no. No, no, no. As he wills. All these work that one and the selfsame spirit, dividing to every man severally as he, as the Holy Spirit chooses, as the Holy Spirit desires, as the Holy Spirit wills. Our part is to make ourselves available. Our part is to exercise our faith and to respond to his supernatural flow. Are we a supernatural church? Yes. Are we full of, are, is this church full of supernatural people? Yes. Then the supernatural people need a supernatural flow. Yes. In order, in order for the signs and the wonders and the miracles to be done, there must be the worker of miracles present. There must be the gifts of the Spirit in operation. Did you recognize that Jesus was baptized in the Holy Ghost? Jesus, our example, our Savior was baptized in the Holy Ghost. He came up out of the water. And as he came up out of the water, let's look at it. I have, I have three different places for you to look. First of all, let's go to Matthew three sixteen. Hallelujah.
first of all, look with me at verse 11, Matthew 3, 11. I indeed, this is, the, this is John the Baptist's words, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that comes after me is mightier than I whose shoes I am not worthy to bear, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So Jesus is identified. What was John the Baptist's mission? What was his assignment? He was to proclaim and point out and identify Jesus. And what did he identify? Not only... We know that he was referred to by John the Baptist as the lamb who takes away the sin of the world. But he is in each of these gospels that we're going to look at. John the Baptist identifies him as well as he that baptizes with the Holy Ghost and fire. Verse 16, Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water and lo, the heavens were opened unto him. This did not say that the clouds rolled back and the sun came out as if it was a cloudy day. And yet a lot of us have had that image in our mind. A lot of people have that idea, oh, the the sun started shining very brightly and the clouds moved away. That's not what this verse said. It said the heavens were opened Take that and and picture in your mind the atmosphere moving and opening a hole in the atmosphere. The heavens were open. It didn't say the clouds moved. It didn't say the sun shone. It says the heavens opened. And he saw the Spirit of God descending. I need you to take the like a dove thing out and move it down for a minute. Just move it over to the side. Come back to it later. Because a bird did not come down and land on Jesus. The Spirit of God descended out of heaven. The heavens, the atmosphere between heaven and earth opened. And the Spirit of God himself, the third person of the Godhead, descended upon Jesus. In the manner of a dove, with the attributes, maybe gently like a dove would float down. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God floated down and landed, descended upon him. In other words, he didn't swoop down like a hawk (laughs) and attack him. He gently descended upon Jesus and lighting upon him and lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. One of the first opportunities we have since Genesis chapter 1 to see the Trinity all in the same place in the scriptures together. Since Genesis chapter 1 where we saw in the beginning was God and, and the Holy Spirit hovered over and God said. We saw the Word, the Son, and we saw the Spirit and we saw the Father. Here again we see all present in this same verse. Look with me as well at Mark 1, verse 10. Hallelujah. Supernatural church full of supernatural people who have a supernatural flow. Mark chapter 1, verse 10. Actually, back up and look at verse 8. John the Baptist said, I indeed baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Verse 10, and straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opened. My center column reference has a note next to that word opened. And it says over in my center column reference that it means cloven or rent. So cloven would mean torn. Torn or rent. The heavens were torn open. The heavens were ripped open. And the spirit descending upon Jesus. And there came a voice from heaven saying, You are my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Verse 12, And immediately the Spirit drives him into the wilderness. (coughs) Hallelujah. So we see him being directed and led. Look also now to Luke 3.21. 
Hallelujah. 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 Actually, let's read verse 16 so we see what John the Baptist said here. John answered, saying unto them, All I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I comes, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Hallelujah. Verse 21, When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened and the Holy Ghost, I love this one, descended in a bodily shape. The Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him and a voice came from heaven which said, you are my beloved son in you, I am well pleased. Can you just circle that word upon there in verse 22? Circle that word upon. Do you know what? It was in Mark 1, 10. The word upon was in Mark 10. And, and I'm just going to back up to Matthew 3 and let's see if it used that same word. Let me see. Upon him. In each one of these examples is the word upon. The Holy Spirit came upon him. Luke 24. Hallelujah. Verse 49. Jesus is giving his last instructions before he ascends to take his position at the right hand of the Father. Luke 24, 49. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. Hallelujah. Upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. The word endued means to put on like a coat. Until you put power on like a coat. Until you be endued with power from on high. When are you going to be endued? When are you going to put on this power like you would put on a jacket, like you would put on a coat? When the promise of the Father is sent upon you. Acts chapter 1. Hallelujah. This is Bible study night, right? Yeah. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Wait, wait, wait. Back up to verse 5. Oh, verse 4. Being assembled together with them, command them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you've heard of me. For John truly baptizes with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days from now. So he is telling them he wants them to wait for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Wait for the promise. And then verse 5, he gives an explanation of, what they're, of the promise they're waiting for. John baptized you with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. When? After you tarry long enough? Till you qualify? No, not many days from now. Not many days from now. So tarrying is not a New Testament protocol for receiving the Holy Spirit. He explained to them they were to tarry in Jerusalem. If we're going to tell anybody they need to tarry for the Holy Ghost, then we need to, by scriptural example, send them to Jerusalem to do so. Buy them a ticket. I mean, if you're going to tell them to tarry, you better make it scriptural. Tarry in the city. He said, not many days from now. The promise is coming. Not many days from now. And then in verse 8, you shall receive power. This word power is the Greek word dunamis. When it says, uh, I give you power over all the power of the enemy so that nothing shall by any means hurt you, that is the word exousia. I give you exousia over all the dunamis of the enemy. I give you authority is the Greek word. I give you authority 
over all of the signs and wonders that the enemy might be able to do. But this word is that word dunamis. You shall receive power. Dunamis. It means explosive power. It's the word, it is the root word there where we form the word dynamite. It's explosive power. One definition is the worker of miracles. You shall receive the worker of miracles. Look it up in the Strong's Concordance. You shall receive the worker of miracles. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You shall receive explosive, miracle-working, healing power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. You shall be endued with power from on high. It said in Luke's 20, Luke 24, 49. You shall put the power on like a coat. You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. Upon you. So he's not talking about the indwelling. When we receive the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, we receive our helper. We receive wisdom. We receive his guidance. We receive him being able to show us and bring things to our remembrance and show us things to come and, and show us what, the, what Jesus meant in those scriptures. He, he brings the word alive to us. He's an inner help. He's an inner guide to us. He's a strengthener, a standby, an intercessor, a mediator, a comforter. That's for our Christian progress, for our overcoming, for our being able to deal with anything and know I've got access to the answer because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. But for us to be a witness for Jesus, for us to be the supernatural church full of supernatural people, we need the supernatural flow. We need the worker of miracles. We need to, to have the baptism in the Holy Spirit so that we can be the testimony of the healing Jesus. The testimony for Him. Bringing to this lost and dying world His power and His ability. You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. So the power to be a witness came when they received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. What were they praying in Acts chapter 4? Those same people in Acts chapter 4 had been baptized with the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. But they recognized something happened that supernaturally provided us a way to be a light unto the world, a city set on a hill, the salt of the earth. We had supernatural flow in us. And Peter, who had denied Christ three times, stood up in the midst and said, Listen here, brothers, it's not what you think. These men are not drunk as you suppose, but they are not. They are full of the Holy Ghost and power. And what you see and what you hear is the promise of the Father. Amen. What were they seeing? They were seeing these people speaking in other tongues. And, and there is a, a supernatural miracle that took place because here in this in this feast day when everybody was gathered from every different region of the land, they were all of different origin and, and different language. And out of the upper room, the power of the Holy Spirit had come upon those who were in the presence and seeking and in one accord, hallelujah. And they came down full of the Holy Holy Ghost with fire and the baptism of fire upon them and they're all worshiping God in another tongue and yet standing here is a man who says, how can you know my language? There's no way you can know my language because I can tell you're a Nazarene and yet you're speaking from my dialect. Because the Holy Spirit was witnessing. They could hear them glorifying God in a language that they knew they couldn't speak. Hallelujah. 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 It was a witness. It was a witness. 
And not only was that a witness, but Peter standing up. He had a boldness that he, he always wanted to have. The reason the man pulled out the, the sword and cut off the ear of Malchus was because he wanted to show, I'm bold for you, Jesus. And yet he stands there and says, I don't know him. I don't know him. Blankety blank, I don't know him. And then he was so ashamed. And so downtrodden and thought, I'm such a failure. I couldn't even stand up for Jesus when he needed me the most. I'm such a loser. But when the Holy Spirit came upon him, a boldness and a testimony came upon him that wasn't, uh, that, 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 that shore up everything. It, it strengthened him in a way to stand for Jesus. And that's what they were asking for in Acts chapter 4. They were asking, Lord, we want this boldness, that we would speak your word with boldness and that your power would flow through us, that you would heal people in Jesus' name, that signs would be done in Jesus' name, that wonders would be performed in Jesus' name. And how did God respond? He filled them with the Holy Spirit again. That's how he responded. If you have a desire in your heart, Lord, I want to lay hands on the sick. Lord, I want to see supernatural things for your glory. I want to set people free. I want to pray with people and see them set free from addiction in a moment. I mean, in a moment. There's a supernatural power. And it's available to his supernatural people. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mark chapter 16 is the great commission. Co-mission. We are laborers together with Christ. And he says in verse 15, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believes not shall be condemned or damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. That's a supernatural flow. That's a supernatural flow. All of those things, these signs that follow believers, are supernatural flows. Casting out devils. That is, an, that is, that is a, a, a joint operation of gifts of the Spirit. That is the, the discerning of spirits to be able to know what you're speaking to exactly. That's the, the operation of the gift of faith. Let's talk about it a little bit. Let's talk, let's talk about these. The gifts of healings. In the Greek, gifts and healings are plural. In the King James, it doesn't have that both ways when it, it, it lists it. But gifts and healings. Those were operative in the Old Testament. The word of knowledge was operative in the Old Testament. If we were to take all those things that we read over there in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and we were to put them in categories. Let's go back and put them in categories and let's kind of look at at how they have manifested in the word of God. Let's look at them. Let's, Let's first of all, let's talk about the revelation gifts. With the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge... And they're not necessarily ordered. We're going to just pull them out into categories to, to look at them. We're talking about the feel something. The word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, and the discerning of spirits. Reveal something. These gifts reveal things. And then there are power gifts. That's what they were praying for in Acts chapter 4. They were praying for power gifts. And so... The gifts of healing. These are gifts that do something. Gifts of healing. The gift of faith. And the working of miracles. Those are all three gifts that do something. 
And then you have the inspiration gifts. These are gifts that say something. The gift of prophecy. Diverse kinds of tongues. And the interpretation of tongues. Interesting note. Interesting note. Remember John 4 is connected to Galatians 5. How many fruit of the Spirit or characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit are there in Galatians chapter 5? There are nine. How many gifts of the Spirit are listed here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12? Nine. Nine gifts, nine fruit. Hallelujah. The indwelling produces the nine fruit. The baptism in the Holy Spirit produces or, or makes available the nine gifts. Although believers will not on a, each believer is not promised that you will operate all nine of those gifts because it says here he will give you several as he wills. So there's an indication that you, it says this manifestation of the spirit is available to every believer, is given to every man as the spirit wills. And then he says severally in that other verse. But it's not that you will operate all nine because only Jesus has been given the fullness of the Spirit, Galatia, or uh, John chapter 3. He has been given the fullness of the Spirit. Jesus operated, we know, in seven of the nine. Tongues and interpretation of tongues began with this church age. But Jesus operated in all the other seven gifts because the fullness has been given unto him. I want to show it to you so you know where to find that one. John chapter 3. Verse 34. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God gives not the Spirit by measure unto him. So he doesn't have the Spirit by measure. But listen... We are the body of Christ. We are the body. We are the body. Together, the body has the fullness. Together, as a church body, and together as the body of Christ across this, this planet, the fullness of the gifts are available. But to each believer, he divides severally. The manifestation of the Spirit is provided or given to every man. So when this, one of the definitions of that phrase, for, to profit with all, means that you would have something to offer. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. The manifestation of the Spirit is given so that you can bring something to the table. Oh, God, so that you can have a part in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now... These gifts, as I mentioned, many of these gifts, except for tongues and interpretation of tongues, you can find them in the Old Testament. Do you remember that there was a king who got so angry he was about to start killing people in his camp because he said every time we go out against Judah, they know where we're going and I think I've got a spy amongst you people and they said, no, 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 you don't have a spy, there's a prophet over there. And God keeps telling him where you're going to be. And every time you come up to attack, they are waiting because there's a prophet. God was speaking to them. There are many examples. When, Eli, when, when Gehazi went out and, and got from Naaman what he wasn't supposed to take from Naaman. After Naaman had gotten healed and, and Elijah uh, had refused the gift and Gehazi followed him and said, hey, hey, I, 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 the master changed his mind. He wants some of that. He came back and, and the man of God said, did not my heart go with you? And he knew exactly what he'd done. That was the word of knowledge. The word of knowledge. When Jesus, and I, let, me, let, me, let me explain. Okay. John chapter 2, Low. verse 11. Low. Hallelujah. Low. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. John 2, 11. I want to show you something. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee. Does your Bible say that was the first miracle that Jesus ever did? 
Did it call it the beginning of miracles? That's the very first miracle. There were no turtles healed. There were no frog legs that got put back together. Jesus wasn't out healing the bumblebee and the butterfly. No miracles took place until this beginning of miracles. Why? Because Jesus came legally as a redeemer. If Jesus brought his God power with him, Satan, Satan already tried to call him on the carpet. Satan already caught him in the synagogue and said, I know who you are. You are the Holy One of Israel and you've come to torment us before the time. You're here illegally. And, and Jesus said, shut up and come out of him. Because he was here legally. He had a legal right to be here. Why? Because Philippians chapter 2 says he stripped himself and came in the form and the fashion of a man. He took off his omniscience. He took off his omnipresence. He took off his omnipotence. And he left it in heaven and he came as a man. And as a man, the Holy Spirit came upon him, the worker of miracles. He put on the Holy Spirit like a jacket. And he began walking around exercising authority. Why? Because he was spiritually alive and spiritually imparted to, spiritually endued with power. And the same way, if you are born again, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And if you have received the baptism in the Holy Spirit, you have put on the Holy Spirit like a jacket and the worker of miracles is now upon you. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! <laughs> Woo! I'm in dude with power! <laughs> Hallelujah! I'm in dude with power from on high! I'm in dude with power from on high! Hallelujah! Hallelujah. 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 So Jesus was operating the gifts of the Spirit. When he looked at Peter and said, go find that, fur, go catch a fish. And the first fish that you catch, there's going to be a coin in his mouth. He knew that by the word of knowledge. When he told them and he said go, or the word of wisdom, because he was speaking about the future. When he looked at that woman at the well and said, yep, you're telling me right, because you've been married this many times and the man you're living with is not your husband. He knew that by the word of knowledge. It wasn't a God trick that is unavailable to you. It was the same spirit, the same spirit, the working of the same spirit. The gifts of healing, Jesus had all of them. Jesus had the fullness of all the gifts of healings. If you listen to ministers who operated in the healing ministry throughout the 50s and 60s and, and 70s, Brother, Brother Hagen would talk about healings and he would say he would recognize that there were certain diseases that he had more success when he prayed for them. And then he said, if, certain, if there were some things, he would say, let my wife pray for you. Because when she prays for that sickness, she has more success in getting those things healed. Why? Because there were different gifts of healings. Some people have a lot of, of strength to pray for cancer. And other people have strength to pray for ears to be opened or blind eyes to see. Because there are gifts of healings. And if the body of Christ throughout begins to operate in the flow of the supernatural provision of the gifts of the Spirit, we would see a fullness. Isn't that what Ephesians chapter 4 is telling us? Until we all come into the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ, the anointed one and his anointing, he said the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. So the anointing is the power and flow of the Holy Spirit. He connected. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Upon me. Because he has anointed me. The word Christ means 
the anointed one and his anointing. Till we all come in the fullness of the measure of the stature of the anointed one and his anointing. It didn't say Jesus. It says Christ. Making a specific emphasis on you and I need to come up to a fullness of the measure of the anointed one and his anointing. Until we are all, if every person in this room was operating at the maximum potential of the anointing upon your life, have mercy. <laughs> Devil couldn't take it. Sickness couldn't stay. The, the, it's not just in the five-fold minister. It's not just in the pastor or in the evangelist or in the prophet or the teacher or the apostle to lay hands on the sick. It's that those who believe. Amen. Why? He wants the gifts of healings operating in the body. So that if pastor is up here praying for people and he says, Hey, Sister Pat, I know you have the healing for this. Come up here and pray for this person. And, and, and who sees a lot of success when you pray for the ears? Come up here and pray for this person. So that we've got a flow. Amen. A supernatural church. Amen. Full of supernatural people. With a supernatural flow. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. The beginning of miracles. Jesus did not do any miracle until this one. This was the beginning. And this occurred after that the Holy Ghost had come upon him. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me for these purposes, to preach the gospel to the poor, deliverance to the captive, recovery of sight to the blind. Do you see the flow of the supernatural? The flow of the supernatural. Hallelujah. Now, when the believer receives the baptism in the Holy Spirit, and can I explain to you that in the book of Acts, in the, in the New Testament church, and we are in the New Testament church, but the recordings that we have is that whenever they found out that people were saved, the very next question was, have they received the Holy Spirit? They never, they, there weren't denominations that set aside the Holy Spirit and said, now, now, that's not for us, and that's not, no, 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 in the, in the, in the New Testament church, if you're saved, we need to have you filled. Amen. Let's look at that in Acts chapter 8. Let me give you some evidence for it. Acts chapter 8, verse 14. Philip had been preaching. And there was a, a salvations. People were, were saved in that city. And in verse 14, when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So they were saved, they were born again, the Holy Spirit was living in them, he was indwelling them, but he had not fallen upon them. Verse 17, then laid they their hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. What did he see? What did he see that gave them him the idea? Now, the initial evidence of the baptism in the Holy Spirit is the speaking with other tongues. We see that from Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost. Back up and look at that. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, what did Jesus tell them they were tarrying for? Yeah, and he said not many days from now. So he had given them an indication, you won't have to wait long. It's not many days from now. 
When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire and it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Who did the speaking? They began to speak. Who gave them the utterance? So the Holy Spirit didn't do the speaking, did He? He gave them the words or the language or the utterance, but they had to move their mouth. They did the speaking. He gave them the utterance. That's important because a lot of people, when they are ready to receive the Holy Spirit, their desire is, I want to receive. But in their mind, they think the Holy Spirit is going to come grab their mouth and move their tongue for them. And we have to recognize and respond in faith to the Holy Spirit and just begin to uh, let what He is putting in our heart come forth out of our mouth. Let me show you that from Acts chapter, uh, chapter 3, verse 38. Peter said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift. The Holy Spirit, He is a gift. The the baptism in the Holy Spirit is the promise of the Father and He has given to you a gift. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. So this is a promise, this is a gift, this baptism in the Holy Spirit. We receive it by faith. We receive Him in this measure by faith. And by faith means I believe that I receive. If I ask, I shall receive. If I seek, I shall find. If I knock, it shall be open unto me. Jesus said, if you ask your Father, if, if, if you being, if you ask your father for a, a piece of fish, he's not going to give you a snake. If you ask your father for a piece of bread, he's not going to give you a stone. You ask, and he's talking about asking for the Holy Spirit. If you ask for the Holy Spirit, he's going to give you the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. And what do we do? We believe it. And we receive. We unwrap the gift. You know, when I received the baptism in the Holy Spirit, I received a word. And I heard other people, and they could talk in sentences. They had all kinds of words flowing out, and I got a word. I got one phrase. But I went home. Anybody else that I had a witness? And Sister Janet, you know what I'm talking about? It, it was, and, I, and I was like, well, this is all I got. But I went home, and in my private time, I would get alone in prayer, and I would just, just take that one word back out. And I would just pray that one word until I, I, was, I felt safer, I guess, at home alone. Because, you know, at church you think everybody's watching for you to start flowing in tongues, you know. But I just, I just started praying what he gave me. Because I believed that he has given me this gift. This is the promise. And, and daddy can't lie. God, it's impossible for him to lie. And the promise is unto you. The promise of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, in Acts chapter 19, we see another evidence of when they encountered someone who was not baptized in the Holy Spirit, but just saved, that they took care of it. In Acts chapter 19, verse 1, And it came to pass, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? Isn't that funny? That that's one of the first questions he asked them. Oh, you're a believer? Do you have the Holy Spirit? Have you been baptized with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues? He, this is the question. This is what they first asked for Samaria. Oh, we've got believers in Samaria? 
Get somebody down there who makes sure they receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Even, even when, when Saul, who became Paul, when he encountered the Lord on the road to Damascus and he went back to the city and, and, and Ananias was sent by the Lord and he walked in and he said, Brother Saul. So we know that somewhere when, when, when he had encountered Jesus and called him Lord, Lord, no man can call him Lord except the Holy Spirit is in him. So Paul had received received Jesus in his heart, but Ananias came and said, the Lord sent me to lay my hands on you so that you could recover your sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. So the Lord sent Ananias to make sure Paul got filled with the Holy Spirit. Why? Because he did not want him only receiving partial of the benefit package available to the believer. He didn't want to leave him without the power to be a witness. Hallelujah. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, I don't even know about the Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, unto them, what were you baptized? And they said unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John truly baptizes with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him who should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Prophecy is a gift of the spirit that we saw from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And they hadn't even been saved long enough to, amount to, 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 to be able to even count a whole day. They just received Jesus. They'd been walking around believing in John's baptism, but they just received Jesus and were filled with the Holy Spirit and gifts started operating immediately. Do you know when... Peter went to Cornelius' house, and we're not going to go there for the sake of time. Maybe next week. If, 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 I, if I'm ministering here next week, we can go back and visit this. But Peter went to Cornelius' house. The Lord had to give Peter a vision because Peter, Cornelius, was not a Jew. Cornelius was a Gentile, and he, he thought he could not even get around any people, much less go in their house. But the Lord gave him a vision about don't call something unclean that I have called clean. And at that very moment when he came out of that trance, he, there are three people at the gate waiting for to take him to Cornelius' house. And so he goes to Cornelius' house and he takes some of the Jewish brothers with him. And they're standing in Cornelius' house and he's preaching Jesus to them. And while he's preaching, nobody's praying, nobody's laying hands. While he's preaching, they get saved and filled with the Holy Spirit at the same time. And the people, the Jewish believers who would not have believed that these Gentiles could be saved, what made them convinced that they were not only saved, but they, they were speaking in tongues. They said, there's no way they could be speaking in tongues except God saved them. Yes. So that speaking in tongues was an evidence to them. But those believers, those people in Cornelius' house, got saved and filled with the Holy Spirit while the word was going forth. Brother Hagen said he was Baptist. Uh, for years before he got filled with the Holy Spirit and, and, and they kicked him out of the Baptist church because of it. But uh, he said when he was a Baptist, he was a, a young Baptist minister. And he said that he would go up into the hayloft and he would pray. And he said, I remember going up there and having times of prayer where I just really wanted to express my heart to God. I really wanted to pray and I really wanted to just tell God, you know, exactly how much I loved him and how much what I wanted to do for him. And he said, there were times that my, my lips would, would begin to get numb. And he said, it scared me because it reminded him of when he had been paralyzed before God healed him. And so he would stop praying and he would come down out of the, out of the hayloft. And he realized later that the Holy Spirit was trying to come on him 
and baptized them in the Holy Spirit then in his own personal prayer life. There was a woman who came back after she had went as a young teenage girl onto the mission field. And she came back when she was like in her 60s. So she had been on the mission field in Africa most of her life. And when she came back, she, she had been, I think, in a Methodist denomination. And she had never heard any teaching about the Holy Spirit. And she came back and she went to a Spirit-filled church. And they were talking about the Holy Spirit. Spirit, and she heard them speaking in tongues, and she says, well, I've been doing that for years. That, I, I got into such a, a situation in my first couple of years in, on the mission field that I just began to call out to God, God, I need help. God, show me what to do. And I began speaking in tongues, and I didn't, she didn't know that she was baptized in the Holy Spirit, but her help came. Praise God. She didn't have the teaching and the doctrine of it. But she had the experience of it and the help it provided for her on the mission field. I want to close with this, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Okay, two things. I'll be quick. I promise. I got so much to say. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Verse 2. He that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto men but unto God. When you pray in tongues, you're speaking to God. And then it goes on to say, how be it in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. When you pray in tongues, you're speaking to God. And you're speaking mysteries that your head may not have full knowledge of, but your spirit can pull that mystery out and then the Holy Spirit can reveal it to you. Verse 4 says, He that speaks in an unknown tongue edifies himself. He that speaks in an unknown tongue edifies himself. Now, this letter is written to the church at Corinth who were, they were a little bit out of balance. And so he's trying to bring balance and show them about speaking in tongues and prophesying and what's good for in church service. But there are truths that we can receive from this at the same time. When I speak in tongues, I'm speaking to God. And I'm speaking mysteries that God understands. I'm, I'm praying the answer. I'm, the, Romans chapter 8 says that I'm praying the perfect will of God when I'm praying in tongues. And this also says that when I'm speaking in tongues, I am edifying myself. Now, this word edified means to charge like a battery. And it takes me to my final, and I promise it's my final verse, Jude chapter 20. I've given you a lot of scripture tonight, but I've helped you tonight. Yes. Jude chapter 20. You, beloved... I'm sorry, Jude, verse 20. There's just one chapter. Verse 20. You, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. He that speaks in tongues edifies himself. You, beloved, building up your most holy faith. That word edified and this word building up has that same meaning of charging like a battery. And in this day of cell phones that get low batteries and people are always hanging out by that place where they can plug their... They, there's plug-in stations everywhere now True. for people to plug in their batteries because their cell phones are going down. If you're standing at the airport, they've got... They've got they, we were in a, a, the airport there in San Diego and we had just been there, what, two years, maybe a year before, and they had added all of these plug stations. I said, this wasn't here last time. And, and every time that I've flown, uh, I've been flying recently, I've seen it, everybody is hovering around the place where they can plug in their phones. Like y'all need a Mophie. Y'all know what a Mophie is? One of those little things you put on your phone. It's got a full battery on it. You know, you carry some battery charge with you, but we can, we, we, we can build up our most holy faith. Praying in the Holy Spirit. We can edify ourselves when we speak in tongues. Why? Because He's the worker of miracles. He's the explosive dunamis power. And the gift, the baptism, the promise of the Father 
is unto you and unto your children. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah.